And I also want to say hi to all of our podcasters. I love these podcasters. Whenever I say hi to them, I get a bunch of emails and they thank me for it. Uh, a couple months ago, I, I said, somebody out there I bet is jogging while they're listening to this message. And I got 16 emails from around the world. People jogging while they're listening to the message. So God bless our virtual congregation. Amen. There's a, there's a lot of them. I love it. I love it. Spreading the word. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to the book of Luke. We're going to be looking at uh, a passage of Scripture here that's traditionally called the Mount of Transfiguration, when Jesus reveals his glory. And I want to entitle this message, A New Kind of Glory. A New Kind of Glory. This passage, folks, is so packed with theological juicy meaning, it's not funny. And there's no way I can possibly unpack all of this uh, in, in the next 45 minutes. It would take at least three hours, and maybe even then some. But I'm going to try to pull out the best nuggets I can. It really is a very profound passage. Uh, Mount of Transfiguration. So it starts in verse 28, reading the book of Luke. This is just what we do here at Wilderness Church. Nothing fancy. Just go through a book of the Bible. And now we're up to this wonderful passage. I sometimes have messages that are more aimed at the heart, whether for healing or motivation. And there's other messages that are a little bit more aimed at the head, that are, are kind of content-filled. This is one of those sorts of messages. So, oh, oh. <laughs> oh no, my head's going to hurt again. Uh, but I encourage you, uh, in the middle of the bulletin, we've got some note pages. If you want to take notes, this is a, a good kind of message to take notes on. So here we go. About eight days after Jesus said this, pause, uh, the this refers to what we talked about last week. And what we talked about last week was when Jesus revealed that even though he's the Messiah, he's going to suffer and die, which shocked the daylights out of all the disciples. So eight days later, or thereabouts, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up into a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. It's bright. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about uh, to, to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Now, it's interesting. They say, it says they spoke to him about his departure. It's, a, it's a, kind of a strange scene that leaves a lot of questions unanswered. Like, wh why were they talking to him? Were they encouraging him? Or were they just finding out about it? Or, you know, there's a lot of questions that we can't get into. But it says that they talked to, to, to him about his departure. It doesn't say his death. And the word departure in Greek is exodus, which we get the word exodus from. And that's going to be important, we'll see later on, because the meaning of this passage is found by looping back to the book of Exodus and to the exodus of the Jews out of Egypt in the Old Testament. And so I, I think there's, there's some of that symbolism being hinted at even already. Moving on. It says, Peter and his companions were very sleepy, which tells us that this probably happened at night. But when they became fully awake, they saw his glory. So the focus is on the glory of Jesus and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving Jesus, as Elijah and Moses were either ascending or starting to disappear or who knows what, but as they were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And then Luke makes a note, he did not know what he was saying. Which is really typical of Peter. You read the Gospels, this guy was always talking first and thinking later. He was always saying the wrong stuff. I love Peter. While he was speaking, so while he's trying to coax Jesus into you know, making this sort of a permanent residence there here, a cloud appeared and covered them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. So this cloud engulfs them, and they're terrified. A voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son, whom I have chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. So somehow Elijah and Moses disappeared in the cloud. The disciples kept this to themselves and did not tell anyone at that time what they had seen. And here's that motif we've seen it over and over again, the motif of secrecy. Uh, Jesus intentionally keeps a lid on, on, on things because he's buying time. He doesn't want to get himself crucified before the right time. He's got to go to Jerusalem for that to happen. And so they keep this whole thing quiet. A new kind of glory. Pray with me here for a moment. Father, I just pray a, pray a blessing on everyone who's listening to this. 
uh, in this auditorium or uh, through podcasting or maybe eight years from now in some other venue. I just bless them in Jesus' name. And I pray, Lord, that you open our ears and open our minds and open our hearts to receive your word. Your word is alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. And we're saying, Lord, this morning, cut. Do surgery on us. Do what we sang about before. Search us and remove anything that's not of you. And God, let this be a kingdom moment that's filled with your spirit, that builds your kingdom. Help us, Lord God, to see more clearly than maybe we've ever seen before the nature of your glory. And to see more clearly, perhaps, than we've ever seen before the nature of what we're supposed to be doing in this world. The nature of the kingdom. But Lord, I know that my words can't do that. And so my total trust and my total confidence is found not in a speech, it's found in you, Holy Spirit, taking these words and infusing them, impregnating them with your authority and your power to change our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. 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 Excellent. I, I want to first uh, paint a big picture of what's going on here, and then I'm going to break it down into a couple, just pull out some juicy nuggets. But uh, first I want to look at the, the, the basic meaning of this text. What's going on in this text? To understand what's going on in this text, to understand what's going on in this event, we need to, you need to see a parallel that's being drawn between what's happening with the disciples and with Jesus on this, on this mountain and what happened on a different mountain in the Old Testament. It was Mount Sinai. If you read Exodus 17 through 24, um, this is a time when Moses had brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. They'd gone through the, the wilderness, and now they came to Mount Sinai. And Moses goes up on the mountain, and that's where he receives the Ten Commandments and a bunch of other uh, you know, parts of the law. And it's where God entered into a covenantal relationship with Israel. It really was the beginning of Israel as God's chosen people. It's where the covenant was, was finally uh, finalized. And there's a lot of parallels between the, the covenant that was made and the event that happened on Mount Sinai on the one hand and what's going on on this mountaintop on the other hand. Here's a few of the parallels. Moses is found in both. They both occur at the top of a mountain. The main characters in both instances become radiant with the glory of God. Uh, there's a great cloud, it says, in both instances that surrounds the people. And the crowd is identified in the Old Testament as the glory of the Lord. There's a voice that speaks out of the cloud. And both, in both instances, the event is centered on an exodus. In the Old Testament, the exodus, it, it culminates the, the Jews' exodus out of Egypt. Uh, in this case, it, it's the beginning of Jesus' exodus towards Jerusalem and ultimately uh, out of this world when he dies, rises again, and then ascends up into heaven. All that's part of his departure, his exodus. So there's a lot of uh, parallels that are going on. And the basic meaning of this text uh, is really twofold. On the one hand, the text is meant to confirm once again the true identity of Jesus. Uh, Jesus had just dropped a bombshell on the disciples telling them that he's going to suffer and die. They all thought the Messiah was supposed to come and defeat the Romans and, 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 and uh, uh, install Israel as a sovereign nation. And so Jesus is telling them, I'm not that kind of Messiah. So this event is going to help the disciples be sure that even though Jesus is going to suffer and die, he really is the Messiah. So it confirms his identity. But more specifically, uh, the event shows that part of Jesus' identity is to be a new Moses. That's what the parallel is all about. Um, he's a new Moses, and he's founding a new Israel. He's, a, he's, he's carving out a new covenant, and he's going to be involved in a new exodus. And, and so really, this, this parallelism is confirming a motif that we've seen throughout chapter 9. And that is that the kingdom of God is a new Israel, and Jesus is a new Moses. And uh, we're a new tribe, uh, you know, going through a new wilderness, and we're part of, a, a, of a, a new exodus. All that is wrapped up into this. Now I want to draw out four particular nuggets from this text. And the way I want to do it is by asking four questions. We always say that the best way to get into a text is just to ask questions. What comes to your mind? Ask questions. You may not be able to answer all the questions, but that is the best way to start, you know, weaving into it, to get to the deep stuff. So question number one. Why Moses and why Elijah? Why those two? Of all the heroes in the Old Testament, why these two? Why not Abraham and Amos, for example? Or why not uh, Joshua and Isaiah or any two other people? Uh, why, what is it about Moses and Elijah that, that uh, justifies them, warrants them 
being part of the, this event. It's done there on purpose. The answer, I think, is this. Moses is always identified with the law. He was the one who gave the law. He received it from God and gave it to the Israelites. He was the one that really began the, the, the whole thing, the whole concept of Israel being a chosen people. The covenant was mediated through him. So he, he, he symbolizes the law and therefore the beginning of Israel. Elijah, on the other hand, in ancient Jewish tradition, he was always associated with the end times, with the end of the age. He was associated with, in some ways, the end of Israel, the fulfillment of Israel, the hope of Israel. And the reason is because uh, Elijah is one of the two people in the Old Testament that didn't die. He was taken up into heaven. The other one was Enoch. And if you look at Micah 4, there's a prophecy that Elijah would return in the last days, in the last epoch. That's why some people in Jesus' time, we saw this last week, they thought that, that Jesus was Elijah. They were expecting Elijah to return. And it's not clear whether that was meant literally or whether that's meant figuratively, like the spirit of Elijah is going to return. But in any case, Elijah was associated with the end of Israel, with the fulfillment of Israel. So by having Moses and Elijah speaking to Jesus on this Mount of Transfiguration, part of what's being communicated in this passage is that Israel, from beginning to end, confirms Jesus. And this is being done so that the, 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 the disciples can connect the dots. That even though Jesus says he's going to suffer and die, this is what it's all about. Israel, what, Jesus fulfills the law. And Jesus fulfills the hope. Jesus is the culmination of everything the Old Testament was really all about. Jesus is the new Israel. And all who submit to him are, by extension, part of this new Israel. The kingdom of God is this new Israel. It all points to Jesus Christ. Now that's reinforced by the fact that a voice comes out of the cloud and says, listen to him. Listen to him. What's going on here is that there's a transference of authority. The emphasis is on to him. Listen to him. He's the one to listen to. And Moses is really saying, he's the man. Listen to him. And Elijah is really saying, listen to him. There's a transference of authority from a Moses and Elijah to Jesus. And the voice confirms that, which tells us that new Israel people are to take our cues, our marching orders, from Jesus, not from something in the old Israel. Uh, Jesus is the definitive revelation of who God is and the definitive commander-in-chief of this new movement, this kingdom of God movement, that is being identified as the new Israel. The author of Hebrews makes basically the same point in, in Hebrews chapter 1 when he says this. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways, and it was all good. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Unlike, he's not just a normal prophet, he's his son, whom he appointed heir of all things. You can't say that about any of the prophets. This is the one who's going to inherit the world. He is the purpose of the world, the reason for existence. And God has now spoken to us through him. And through whom also he made the universe. That can't be said of any of the prophets. This is the creator. And unlike all previous revelations, as good as they were, unlike all previous prophets, the Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation. Not an approximation here. God's not sort of like this. Rather, he's the exact representation of his being. Hypostasis in Greek. It means essence. Uh, this is what God really is like. In contrast to all the approximations we've had in the past, this is the real deal. Sustaining all things by his powerful world. Uh, word. What, what, what Hebrews 1 is saying, and this is part of what's being intimated uh, in the Luke passage that we're looking at, is that as great as the stuff that the ancestors gave us was, as, as good as the stuff that came from Moses, and as good as the stuff was that came from Elijah, as good as all of that is, the Son supersedes them all. Because the Son gets to the very essence of God. The Son is the exact representation of God. The Son is himself a, the, the manifestation of what God really is like. So the voice says, listen to him. Uh, don't, don't go listening to other places. Listen to him. Focus on him. Moses was great. And, and Elijah was great. The prophets was great. The law is great. The Old Testament's all inspired by God. But we kingdom people, part of the new Israel, are to listen to him. 
have our eyes focused on Jesus and our ears tuned to Jesus Christ. We take our marching orders from Jesus Christ. So if Jesus tells us to love our enemies, for example, our job is to listen to him and love our enemies. And it doesn't matter that you can find some passages in the Old Testament where the people of God didn't love their enemies. We take our marching orders from Jesus Christ. And if Jesus says, take up the, our cross and follow him, our job is to listen to him and take up our cross and follow him. And it doesn't matter that you can find passages in the Old Testament where people didn't take up the cross. They took up the sword. We take our marching orders from him. And if Jesus says, never retaliate, our job is to never retaliate. Our job is to listen to him. And it doesn't matter that you can find some verses in the Old Testament where it says, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. That was then. This is now. That was Old Covenant. This is New Covenant. We listen to him. We take our marching orders from Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Moses. Moses is saying, this is the man. And Jesus is saying, this, or, and Elijah is saying, this is the man. And the cloud is saying, this is the man. And I'm telling you, this is the man. <laughs> Listen to the man. He's the man. <laughs> the the uh, take-home point, the take-home point is, is this. Be very, very wary of people who base a doctrine strictly on the Old Testament. Your eyebrows should be raised. He's like, well, okay, now where's that in the New Testament? Uh, where's that in the ministry of Jesus? Be very careful about that. And there's a lot of that going around, folks. And be very careful about anyone who justifies a behavior strictly on the basis of the Old Testament. And be very careful about anyone who justifies an attitude strictly on the basis of the Old Testament. Our marching orders come from Jesus Christ and the new, the, the new covenant that he has forged, not from the Old Testament. Sometimes people ask me, why don't you ever preach the 10% doctrine, the tithing doctrine? That everyone's supposed to give 10%. I think that's a good benchmark, giving 10% of your, your income to the kingdom. But I won't put it out there as a rule. Why? Because that's found in the Old Testament, but it's never found in the New Testament. And we're New Testament people. The New Testament principles give out of the abundance of your heart, give joyfully. God loves a, a joyful giver. Paul had a lot of opportunities to invoke the 10% rule, and he never did it. He appeals to the Spirit of God and to search God and give as God, uh, as God leads you and where God leads you. And so you've got to trust the Spirit of God on that, 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 that thing. There's times where I'd like to invoke the 10% rule. <laughs> I'm not going to do it. You start invoking the Old Testament, something that's just found in the Old Testament, and see, to be consistent, which no one ever is, but then you have to preach the whole Old Testament law as, 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 as a New Testament thing. We'd, uh, you know, right, we'd start preaching against wool and cotton uh, being worn together because that's in the Old Testament. How come no one ever preaches on that? Or as I mentioned a couple weeks ago, you know, we ought to be preaching that women in their time of the month should be wearing clothes, a special cloth that advertises to everybody what's going on because that's in the Old Testament. It's a law. Some women are saying, thank you, Jesus, that we're not in the Old Testament. <laughs> but it's... It's very selective. Okay, our marching orders come. We're part of the new covenant, and so we take our cue. Only when something is consistent with the, what we find in the New Testament and re, is reiterated in the New Testament, only then can we say for certainty that it has authority over us. Let's go to the second um, uh, question. What else is involved in the command, listen to him? And the answer is a lot. A lot. There's a, th this one is packed with meaning. Okay, so keep your thinking caps on. Here we go. Read any commentary you want on this passage, and you're going to find this. Uh, they will tell you, the scholars will tell you, that this phrase, listen to him, is a quote. It's a quote. They're quoting the Old Testament. And it, what, what, what they're quoting is Deuteronomy 18.15. What, what the voice is quoting is Deuter Deuteronomy 18.15, which says this. This is Moses talking, and Moses prophesies, saying, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me, from among you, from among your own people. In other words, look forward to a day when there's going to come a Jewish prophet. And then Moses says, listen to him. You must listen to him. Now Jesus was this prophet that was prophesied uh, by Moses, and so he's a prophet like Moses. Though he, is, he goes beyond Moses. You can even see that in the text in, in the fact that on Mount Sinai, when Moses came down, his face was radiating from being in the presence of God. But Jesus, his whole body was, was radiating. It was manifesting this brightness like, like, like a, a bolt of lightning. So it, it was a way of showing that the glory of Jesus goes far beyond the glory of Moses. But now I want to ask the question, how much farther does it go? And you'll find this out by going back to the verse that was quoted and reading the next verse. It's always important to read verses in context. 
If you look at Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 and 16, you'll find this. Moses says, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you. Now listen to this. For this is what you asked of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when he said, uh, when you said, Let us not hear the voice of the Lord our God or see this great fire anymore or we will die. Okay, now look at this. God wanted a direct relationship with his people. That was always his plan. He wanted to be their direct king, didn't want a mediator king, didn't want a mediator prophet. He wanted to deal with them face to face. He wanted a direct relationship with his people. But the people couldn't handle it. They were freaked out. His voice is so loud and the fire is so bright and it's terrifying. <laughs> and so they, they said this. They said, Moses, you know, I'll tell you what, you go up there and will you tell Yahweh that we're terrified of him? And so can we just deal with you? You, you, you be our go-between here, all right? Uh, you're a lot safer than, 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 than Yahweh. And so God acquiesced to that. He, he's, a, he's, a, he's a God who's flexible. So he says, all right, I overwhelm him, I terrify him. hate when that happens, but, but uh, they're terrified, so I'll give you a prophet to kind of be a, a, a mediator here. You ought to know this, that there is in the fallen world almost an incurable religious impulse to do that. Uh, people are afraid of God, and so... You look at all religions throughout history, including the Christian religion, and you'll find a tendency to uh, put religious professionals up on a pedestal to be the kind of mediators between you and God. And these are the people whose prayer counts the most, and these are the people who are extra holy, and these are the people who've got a special anointing, and these are the people who do all the good stuff. And the job of everybody else is just to sacrifice a little bit of money to support them. And the New Testament says hogwash on all of that. We're supposed to have a direct relationship with God. <laughs> Amen. You go directly to God. Do not pass through Greg or Billy Graham or anybody else. You go directly to God. If God uses, you know, teachers and, and prophets and whatever, that's great. But, 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 but you go directly to God. But there's this, this, this tendency, even in, in Protestant circles, to elevate a pastor. Whenever, you know, a pastor goes over to dinner, he always or she always has to be the one to pray. Why is that? Well, pastor, will you pray for us? This is the idea that your prayers count more. And I'm here to tell you, they don't. They don't. My prayers and Billy Graham's prayers and your prayers and Joe Schmo's prayers right over there, it's all the same. And so pray and go directly to God when you do this. So, so God, God conceded and, and gave them a prophet. And Jesus is the fulfillment of that concession. The, the, Moses was the first concession. Jesus is the fulfillment of this concession. He's the prophet, the human prophet that was prophesied. But, now listen to this. He's also the fulfillment of God's original dream of having a direct relationship with his people. Because Jesus Christ is not just a human prophet. He himself is the presence of Yahweh here on earth. And this, I believe, is the most beautiful and most shocking, most amazing, most wonderful revelation in the whole Bible and in all of human history. Jesus isn't just a human prophet. He's the Lord God Almighty, sneaking up on us, as it were, in prophet form. All right? He's coming kind of as a stealth thing. Uh, you can't handle, you can't handle me. And so I'm going to kind of roll myself in, in, in this human flesh, and I'll come to you in, in a way that, 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 that you can uh, receive. Now, even in the Old Testament, you find hints that the coming prophet would not just be a prophet, but would, would be the Lord God Almighty. He was dropping hints here and there. For example, in uh, Zechariah chapter 12, Verse 10, this is the Lord God Almighty speaking. And he says, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. Okay, he's referring to the end times when Paul tells us in Romans 11, he's going to bring back Israel to himself. He hasn't quit on the nation of Israel. Uh, they're going to be kind of like the bookend marker of this epoch of history. But then look at this. He says, they will, in that day, they will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn. Now, the one they have pierced is obviously Jesus Christ. 800 years before Jesus ever came around, we have a prophecy that this man would be pierced, but this man would also be Yahweh himself. The Lord is speaking. He says, they will look upon me. He's talking about Jesus. What does that tell you? Jesus is Yahweh in human form, even there in the Old Testament. Another interesting passage is Isaiah chapter 9, where the prophet says, For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. Now, Matthew in chapter 1 applies this specifically to Jesus Christ. There's a child that's going to be born. There's a son that's going to be given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, 
mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He's going to be a child. That means he's going to be human. He's also going to be mighty God. Mighty God in child form. It's there in the Old Testament. And you find this all over the place in the New Testament. It's, it's the revelation of revelations. Uh, John 1.1, 1, 1, for example, says the Word, who of course is Jesus Christ. The Word was God, pure and simple. Romans 9.5, Jesus is called God overall, blessed forever. Titus 2.13, Jesus is called our great God and Savior. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8, uh, Scripture says, Thy throne, O God, speaking to the Son, he says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. In Revelations chapter 1, verses 17 and 18, Jesus says, I am the first and I am the last. Now what's really interesting is that if you look at that phrase, I am the first and I am the last, it's found over and over again in the Old Testament, and it's always spoken by Yahweh. In fact, if you read Isaiah uh, chapters 42 through 48, thereabouts, it's, uh, the Lord always is saying this. In fact, the Lord says, I am the first and I am the last, I am the beginning and I am the end, and beside me there is no God. Only God can say, I am the first and I am the last. Because what it really means is, go back, go back as far as you want, and I'm still there. Go forward as far as you want, and I'm still there. Only God can say that. And yet Jesus says that. Jesus is Yahweh himself in, 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 in human form. The fact of the matter is that according to biblical teaching, Jesus is fully human and also fully God. God has given us the prophet as a matter of concession. But now what we learn in the New Testament is that God himself is the prophet. It's like the Lord is saying, they're too terrified of me. My power, my glory, my holiness overwhelms them. So I will robe myself in flesh, and I'll come in the form of a lowly, humble, unthreatening carpenter. So in Jesus Christ, God comes to us. Yahweh comes to us. But no longer as the Mount Sinai terrifying God. He comes to us in the form of a humble human being. He comes in the form of a lowly carpenter. God himself comes in the form of a little baby. God himself comes in the form uh, of, of an outcast. He identifies with the outcast. He identifies with the rejects. He identifies with the sinners. He identifies with the poor, uh, the, the, the condemned criminals. He comes as a servant and a lover of, of human beings. And what's happening here, folks, is that on the Mount of Trigger, Transfiguration, the Lord's trying to connect the dots for his disciples and also for us that the humble servant, suffering Messiah, is one and the same with the Mount Sinai God. And so what he does is a little peekaboo. Uh, he kind of uh, opens up the flesh, and, and you get this, ah! and there's a bright light and all that kind of stuff. Here's the glory, whoop, you know. And, and, and so they're seeing a little taste of Mount Sinai here because he's revealing his glory. Uh, he's letting him in on the secret. You know, you know, this is Yahweh in this stealth operation here. It's Yahweh in, 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 in human flesh. It reminds me of a revelation that I gave somebody in first grade. Not quite as impressive as Jesus is here, but, but I'll give it to you anyways. <laughs> you see, most kids pretend, most boys pretend like they're super boy when they're in first grade or second grade or college, whatever. But, <laughs> but see, I, I thought I was super boy. I really did. I, I, uh, I, I, I was a little out there. I really thought I was Superboy. And so I, Superboy's got to have in a costume, so I made a costume. We couldn't afford to go out and buy a, a Superboy outfit, so I had a T-shirt, and um, I, I colored it all blue, and I made the big S and, you know, the, the Superboy kind of thing. And then I got uh, a bed sheet, and I made a, a cape, and I colored it with, with red crayon, and I put it on my neck, and I connected it with a safety pin, and I would wear it under my clothes <laughs> all the time. How they ever let me out of the institution, I don't know. I, <laughs> and you're sitting here listening to me. <laughs> what does that say about you? Uh, so I had this secret identity because you never know when a cute girl is going to be attacked by a villain and need Superboy. So I always had the Superboy thing. Stay clear of kryptonite. I was, I, you know, I was, and so, but there was one girl in first grade, St. Patrick's School in Ohio, uh, where I, I was in love with. Teresa Griffith was her name. God bless you, Teresa Griffith, if you're listening right now. I thought we were going to get married. And uh, so I thought I had an obligation to let my future spouse in on the secret. <laughs> so one day out in recess, I took her to the side. And I said, I want to show you something. And I unbuttoned my shirt. <laughs> she was getting worried at this point. But, uh, and I, I let her see the big S. And all I did was I just shook my head yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> proof. It's proof. Oh, yeah. Lucky girl. 
I got you covered. <laughs> well, that's something like, a little bit like what, what Jesus is doing. He's sort of, you know, unbuttoning the flesh, if you will, and going, ah! and the glory comes out because he's trying to help the disciples connect the dots. The Mount Sinai, ah, God, is one and the same with the one who's going to suffer and die, the humble servant. And uh, what's most amazing about this, folks, is this. Jesus isn't just taking on, it's not just a stealth operation as though Jesus is putting on a human outfit. As though, as though the, the, the humanity of, of Jesus doesn't really reveal uh, who he's like. But rather, he doesn't put on a human outfit. He doesn't just pretend to be human. He really becomes human. It says in John chapter 1 that the word became flesh. The flesh didn't hide the word. The word became the flesh. The word became humanity. That's why Jesus can say, if you see me, you see the Father. It's not that the Father is hidden inside or behind the, the, the humanity, as though God was wearing a human f mask of some sort. But rather, Jesus is saying, my humanity reveals my divinity. My humility reveals my glory. I really am like this. Uh, the agony I'm going to go through reveals my true character. The way I serve the suffering and the outcast and the poor, that's who I really am. What I'm doing as a human doesn't conceal who I really am. Uh, like there's, that, like there's a, the, the real God is the Sinai God hiding somewhere inside Jesus, that, like you'd find a nut inside of an acorn or something. No, they're one and the same. God reveals what he's really like when he becomes a human being, what he's really like when he serves people, what he's really like, his heart of hearts, when he dies uh, for the very people who are crucifying him on Calvary. Uh, God, is, God is sort of saying something like this. There was times where I had to reveal my awesome, tremendous, terrifying holiness and power in the Old Testament, but now I'm coming stealth in, as his prophet, and now I'm going to show you what I'm really like. Yahweh is saying, my innermost heart has always been to love you, not to terrify you. My innermost heart has always been to embrace you, not to reject you, to heal you, not to smite you. My innermost heart has always been to unite myself with you in love, not cast you aside. My, my innermost heart has always been to die for you, not have you die from me. That's why Hebrews 1 says, the passage we read earlier, that the Son, in contrast to everybody else, the Son is the exact representation of the Father's very essence. He's not an approximation of one or two attributes of God. This is what God really is like. When God reveals his innermost heart, when God really opens himself up, you don't get the Mount Sinai, ah, oh, thing, you get Jesus Christ dying on Calvary. Which is why, if we want to know what God is really like, we shouldn't be taking our cues from the Mount Sinai revelation. We're to take it from the Mount Calvary revelation. Because that's where the real glory of God is found. If you're here today, or you're listening by podcast, and you're not related to Jesus Christ, the Bible says it's a scary thing to be in an unredeemed state in the presence of God. You still need to worry about that Mount Sinai thing, the holiness of God. But if you know Jesus Christ, if you've surrendered to Jesus Christ, if you're in Jesus Christ, if you're walking with Jesus Christ, well, the Bible says perfect love casts out fear, and what Jesus Christ is is perfect love. There's no place for terror, that kind of fear, in the heart of any believer. John says even when our own hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts. Praise God for that. For that. There's no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Believers need to have an awe and a respect for the tremendous awesomeness of God. But that's not a terrifying kind of thing. That's just a, a reverence kind of a thing. But see, knowing who God really is, God's not given to us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of self-control, which is why we can go boldly before the throne of grace. With confidence we go before God because we're seated in Christ Jesus. We know who God really is. And while he's got this terrifying holiness, he now reveals to us his heart of hearts is to be for us, not against us. He's our redeemer. He's our friend. He's our savior. He's our father. He's our heavenly spouse. He's the lover of our soul. Every ounce of his being, his essence is revealed in the Son. And we see here that he's for us and not against us. That's why we need to find all of our cues, all of our information about what God is like, all of our information about our worth is to be found in Jesus Christ. Listen to him. All your life is to be found in him. Your worth, your significance, your value, your security, get it all in him. Listen to him. What's the point of the cloud? Question number three. What's the point of the cloud? The point of the cloud is really just to confirm everything I just told you. Uh, the cloud in the Old Testament always represented the awesomeness, the terror of God, the, 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 the tremendous 
power and holiness of God. Which is why whenever the cloud showed up, the people were afraid. That's why the people begged God to give them a prophet. They don't want to deal with the cloud. It's too loud. It's too much brightness. We're scared. That's why when the cloud shows up here, the disciples are good Jews trained in the Old Testament. So what do they do? Like Jews in the, first, in the Old Testament did, they freaked out. Ah, the cloud! It's, 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 we're going to be crushed. He's going to smother us. He's going to boil us. He's going to torture us. Something. But see, here's the thing. That's Mount Sinai stuff. On this mountain, the cloud comes, but the cloud simply confirms Jesus. The center of the cloud and the meaning of the cloud is found in Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is the one who said, I'm going to suffer and die for sinners. The glory of Mount Sinai, which was so terrifying, is now transferred over to the glory of Jesus Christ. And we see the true glory of the Mount Sinai God in Jesus Christ. The true glory of God when he serves the poor, when he heals the sick, when he sets captives free. The true glory of God is found when he throws parties with tax collectors and prostitutes. Very different from the Mount Sinai God. But, but this is why he's trying to connect the dots for his disciples and he's trying to do it for us right now. The true glory of God is found. It's, the cloud is centered on the, the, the Christ who takes up his cross and dies for his enemies. Which is why, again, I reiterate, if you want to find out what God is really like, don't take your cues, New Testament person, from Mount Sinai, the top of Mount Sinai. Take it from the top of Golgotha, from the top of Calvary. Which leads to my final question. Why did Peter want to build three shelters? I love Peter. Now see, Peter, Peter was always the one. You, you read the Gospels, and Peter's always the one who is most resistant to any talk about suffering. He's the one most committed to the militant Messiah. He wants a Messiah who's going to defeat the Romans and reinstate Israel as the sovereign nation, maybe the sovereign nation over the whole earth. That's what he thought the Messiah was supposed to do. And Jesus kept contradicting him, and Peter kept getting upset. If you read Mar Matthew 16, which is the parallel to the passage we read last week where Jesus first reveals that he's going to suffer and die. In, in the Matthew account, Jesus says, I've come to suffer and die. And Peter has the audacity to say, we're not going to let you do that. <laughs> We are not going to let you do that. And so Jesus tops him and says, get behind me, Satan. Poor Peter. He just, you know, and, and this is three verses after Jesus said, oh, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood didn't reveal to you, reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. Three verses later, get behind me, Satan. How quickly things change. Uh, but, but, but this is Peter's mindset. So Peter's got this militant view of, of the Messiah. So when he sees the glory... He is going to interpret that through his military grid. And now he'll, he's thinking to himself, yes, this, oh yeah, this is what I'm talking about. This is what the Messiah is supposed to do. Give us more of that glory stuff. Forget that suffering, dying stuff. This is Mount Sinai stuff. He's picking up the cue. Yeah, this is what we knew. You had us fooled there with all that suffering talk. Now shine forth your oh, glory. Show us what you're really like. Yes, the glory. And with that glory, we can trample the Romans. And with that glory, we can reinstate Israel. This is heaven here. And we got Moses here and Elijah here to boot. This is, let's freeze frame this moment. And so when he sees Elijah and Moses starting to fade away, it's like, don't, don't, don't go, don't, 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 no, stick here. We'll build your houses. You know, let's make this a permanent residence. Let's live on the mountaintop. This is glory land here. We'll start our mile high joy holiness kingdom club right here. And, and Jesus, uh, you're good at multiplying food and fishes and stuff, so you just keep feeding us and we'll live, stick it out right here. You see, forget about those, he's really saying, forget about those losers down at the bottom of the hill. Oh, those needy people down there, they all got demons, they're sick, they all, you know, are constant clamoring for us. And forget all this talk about suffering and dying. No more of this. We're in the glory land. Show us more of that glory. And so let's have some houses here. Freeze frame this moment. And Luke says very appropriately, he did not know what he was saying. <laughs> he did not know what he was saying. Because, see, what he was saying contradicts the very meaning of what was going on there. The reason Jesus is talking about, Moses and, and Elijah are talking about death, and then he shows the glory. He's trying to get their neural nets to associate together. Suffering Messiah, Mount Sinai glory, one and the same. He's trying to connect them, get them to connect the dots. Peter clearly is not connecting the dots. Uh, he, the, the whole point of the passage is to say that the Mount Sinai God does not stay up on a mountain. He rather comes down as one of us. God did not grab hold. It says in Philippians 2, God didn't cling 
to his prerogatives as God. He didn't just sit around and enjoy the bliss and the privilege of being God and the, 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 you know, just the, the, the untroubled convenience of, of being the master of the universe. He didn't stay in heaven in the bliss of heaven in the perfect love of the triune God, but rather the glory of God is shown in the fact that God the Son was willing to forego all of that Empty himself, it says in Philippians 2. Put on, become one with human nature. Enter into our human nature. Enter into our finitude. Enter into our sin. Enter into our rebellion. Take it all upon himself on the cross. Experience hell for us. And that we're now learning is the glory of God. The glory of God is not so much found in the awe experience on the top of the mountain. The glory of God is coming down from the mountain, divesting yourself of the privilege of the mountaintop experience, and now serving the sick and serving the poor and serving the outcast and embracing people and dying for your enemies if necessary. That's what the real Mount Sinai glory is all about. And if we're going to be people who glorify God, as we sometimes say, the purpose of life is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Heidelberg Confession. I don't know where that came from. I haven't recited that in 41 years, but it just came to me right now. The glory of God. It says, what is the, what's the chief end of man? To glorify God and, and enjoy him forever. Well, that's true. We're supposed to glorify God. But what is the glory of God? The glory of God is not so much the Mount Sinai. It's Mount Calvary. And we are glorifying God when we are coming down from the mountain. If we're going to glorify God, it means we can't ever pitch our tent on a mountain. If we're going to glorify God, we've got to get out there into the trenches. That's what the glory of God, the real glory of God, is all about. It's coming down from the mountain and getting in the trenches and assuming the position of a condemned criminal, as we said last week. Not feeling condemnation, but simply foregoing all claims to superiority and washing the feet of everybody who needs foot washing. What it means to glorify God, people, is to imitate Jesus, which means we forego privilege in order to serve. That's the glory of God. That's, that's the glory of the new covenant revelation of God, of God. It might mean that you forego just cashing in on the, on the privilege of your wealth and you glorify God by how you share that and how you invest it in the kingdom. It may mean we forego the, uh, the, the mountaintop privilege that we might have uh, with our religiosity. You might be inclined to look down the mountain at those losers down there, but to glorify God means you don't look down. Rather, you come down and wash their feet. It means that whatever access to convenience and privilege that we have, that we could cash into and just enjoy ourselves, the glory of God is found when we begin to let go of that and now seek first the kingdom of God and use it to advance God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. The glory of God might be the fact that we don't just hang around in our blessed experiences. Sometimes we have mountaintop experiences. Some of us do. It may be in a worship service where you just really experience the glory of God. Maybe once in a blue moon, it's, uh, a revelation as, as, uh, as, as the person is, is delivering the word. You all of a sudden get it. It's the glory of God. Maybe it's in your prayer closet. Or maybe it's when you're worshiping at home. But you can have these experiences where you just feel close to God and you get it. That's wonderful. Enjoy that. Nothing wrong with that. They have those aha light moments. But that is not the end in and of itself. The, the purpose for that is now to do the real glory of God, which is having it motivate you to get out there and serve and sacrifice and change the world by the way you imitate Jesus Christ in loving all people at all times in all situations, no ifs, ands, and buts. That is the glory of God. It's found in sacrificial service. We've got 50 or so people helping out at Ames Elementary School and in other inner city schools. They're glorifying God. Every Monday morning I come in here and there's one dear soul in our church who's fixing up the walls and touching up things and just taking care of our building. No one knows that he's doing that. He's glorifying God. He's, he's serving you and he's serving God by, by, by doing uh, a gift that he has. Uh, when people are w- working inner city ministry with Sandra's uh, lift ministry or, or Here's Life Inner City or the folks who are helping in the Native American Reservation or the homeless shelter or, or, or just uh, helping the elderly in their neighborhood or sacrificing money for uh, AIDS in Africa or sacrificing money for the furthering of the kingdom in the states, or or in this ministry, all of that, that is how we really glorify God. It's not found primarily in the Mount Sinai mountaintop experience. It's when we come down from the mountain, and we get on our knees, and we just serve. We imitate Jesus. That's the real glory of God. The glory revealed ultimately on Mount Calvary. To close your eyes for a moment, I want to give the Holy Spirit a chance to seal this message. Have your way, Holy Spirit. Work in our hearts. Try to be very honest in these moments. And I just want to ask the the question, the obvious question to ask after this message is, are you glorifying God? 
That's not about what you believe. That's about how you live. And I want to ask the Holy Spirit here to reveal to us if there's any part of our life where we're, we're missing an opportunity to glorify God. And it may be because you're addicted to some sort of privilege you have, some sort of benefit you have, and you're cashing in on yourself. I want you to remember that that's not what God did. God laid it aside to enter into where we were at. And God calls us to lay power and privilege and any other access to stuff we have in order to enter into solidarity with others. Is there an area of your life that God would call you to do that with? Maybe a person, that maybe a ministry, or maybe something you have that God, without knowing exactly what you're supposed to do with it, maybe the Lord is saying, I want you to, no, set that aside. And forego it, maybe sell it, and I'll tell you what to do with it. Whatever it is, Holy Spirit, just, just reveal to us what we need to know right now. And be honest. And when something comes to your mind, just commit to it. Just say, Lord, when I'm sure this is you, I, I will do that. I'll come down from that mountain. I'll get in the trench. I'll bleed. I'll glorify you. If you're here this morning and you're not in a relationship with Jesus Christ, you need to be. You really do need to be. Because it is, the Bible says, a scary thing to fall into the hands of a righteous God in an unredeemed state. Just right now, surrender your life to Jesus. You just turn over control. Confess that you're a sinner. Ask him to forgive you. And surrender control of your life. Right where you're at. And if you're doing that right now, I encourage you to come up. And if our prayer team would come up right now, these folks would love, I, I want, want, tell them what you did and they'd like to pray with you and help you get started on your walk with God. Kingdom people, you just listen to what the Holy Spirit's telling you and commit to it. Do your work, Holy Spirit. And as I close in this prayer, I just want to say, the altar is open. If you want to come forward and pray, you can kneel here. Or if you want to pray with our prayer team, about any matter whatsoever, I encourage you to do that. I also encourage you to spend a little time out in the gathering area, just seeing people who are by themselves and welcoming them. But Lord, as we leave this place, we ask God that your real glory, your true glory, the Calvary glory, would shine through us, Lord. The glory of your humility, let it shine through us. The glory of your generosity, let it shine through us glory of your willingness to be inconvenienced. Let it shine through us, Lord God. Build your kingdom in us. Build your kingdom through us, that we may glorify you now and forever. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said one last time. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Go out and build the kingdom.